welcome to volume six of Carp Tackle Tactics and Tips. My name is Danny Fairbrass and I am attached to what is hopefully a very large carp at Etang de Lahore in central France. This is the first of the venues we're going to be showing you on the DVD. We're also going to be going back to Gigantica in search of the monstrous carp there and we'll be fishing several waters in the UK as well. So there'll be loads of different styles of fishing shown and loads of new tackle and new tactics and new tips for you. So uh, I'm going to concentrate on this fella. I've hooked him at 130 yards and for this first section it's all about long range fishing because Lahore is uh, a very big lake but it's very very shallow. It's only four to five feet deep and the fish love living a long way out. Let's just keep this underneath the other line. So first of all, we'll be looking at casting styles, the rods and reels to use, the line to use, the rigs to use. And uh, as usual, I'm joined by a host of Europe's best carp anglers who are all good at various styles of fishing. I'm here with Damien Clark at Lahore and uh, he's a brilliant long range angler. So we'll be pumping him for information as well. Not a monster by Lahore standards. They're, uh, commons in here to uh, mid 70s but uh, very welcome all the same <clears throat> okay fella time for the landing net in you come gotcha what a way to start volume six As I said, we've got loads of new bits to show you on the DVD, some brilliant tactics as well, and some awesome anglers. So uh, we're gonna do a few pictures of this one, get him back and get on with all that tackle. Yes, good man. Look at well done, son. Good at angling. After a very dogged fight, Mr. Clark has got an absolutely beautiful 33 pounder there. Um, taken on a very simplistic rig, we're fishing at extreme range here. And the most important thing is that the rig doesn't tangle. So we're going to do a few shots and then we're going to show you the all important rig. This is the first time ever I've not seen you with a bit of shrink tube on the hook. Yeah, probably is. Mate. Ever, ever, yeah, ever, yeah. in all the times we've been fishing. So tell me, first of all, why you've swapped over to that, and then also tell us how to tie it. Well, really, it's, it's simply because um, we're fishing in pretty wild conditions. We've got crosswinds. Um, I just wanted a really simple rig that I hadn't got a PVA up the hair, right. um, something that's not going to tangle. Right, okay, because we, we, you don't get it on the spot first time every time, do no. you? It's a long way out there, 130, 140 yards, and it's just something that you know is going to be sitting perfect on the bottom yep, yep. every single time. You just can't risk having a tangle. So. No, no, and also tying the hair up with PVA, putting foam on and all that, if you're trying to get three rods close together, it all gets you out of your rhythm, doesn't it? It becomes a total nightmare. Yeah, it does. So what, so what hook have you got on there and how have you tied it right. on? I've got a um, size six uh, Choddy B because it's barbless over here. Okay. Um, ultra sharp, you know, based on the Bygate pattern. 
yep. re really good hook that I'm confident with. Um, I'm fishing with um, a plastic bait, plastic uh, corn, played with the IB. You know, it's a bait I've caught loads and loads of fish on over the years. Yep. Purely for visual, you know, the yellow bit, got corn right. in the mix, so, you know, that's why I'm using that. Uh, this is a mainline cell dumbbell, right. which we've laced up with a bit of tuna oil. Yep. Um, I've got 20 pound Entrap Soft, fished with uh, the, the coating removed for the hair, so it's nice and soft. Okay, so how, how have you tied that to get that so that the, because you, you, it's coated all the way up into the eye of the hook, yep. but then the coating disappears and then, you, then you've got your, I'm guessing, is that not the snot there? Yeah, it's not the yeah. snot, yeah. Um, so how, how have you done that to, to get that just right? Well, basically I, I stripped some off um, and it took, you know, a few goes to get it right, but it's about six centimetres. So when you tie the hook, um, you've got six centimetres of um, uncoated from the eye of the hook back. And then you whip down the hook, say, 10, 12 times. Right. And then you pull the hair back out of the way right. and then go behind it or in front of it rather. So it's causing it to kick away from the yeah, hook just a little right bit, right at the top. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, okay. a, it's a rig that Daryl Peck's been using, um, but Daryl Faber's putting the coating all the way round. Yep, um, so, so the knot is coated exactly. and everything. Right. But because, because it's so extreme here and we're using really big leads, when the uh, bait hits the water, it tends to pull the hair really tight and kick the hook round. So the hair's coming off the, the side, side of the hook yeah. rather than the and back of the hook. It doesn't sit quite right. right. So after a couple of casts, I realised that's what was happening, so I changed it and then pulled the uh, braid really tight so it's properly strangled itself. So the way it is there is the way it is on the bottom? Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. And having it solid all the way through, that's the thing that's stopping the tangles, is it? Yeah, well, I think so. I mean, because it's a crosswind and you can't feel it down properly, anything to stop it tangling, I've just done that. And right. the this, this stuff is so soft that, you know, because the bottom's so um, soft as well, there's, there's no chance of it, the hook and the rig sitting up off the bottom. Yeah, because, the, I mean, the leads are plugging right, right in, in, even yeah. though we're fishing against the clip, it's only four foot deep, four ounce lead at 130 yards, it's going fast, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and in and crosswind, you can't, yeah. you just can't feel it's it. It's impossible to slow them down, really. So, you know, having something a little bit longer, a bit softer, even if the lead plummets in, you're still going to have it sitting on, flat, on yeah. the top, and the sinker, I guess, helps that. Yeah, it just it? helps that. I pull it down onto the bottom. You right. know, I, w I mean, over particle, I wouldn't normally fish a rig as long as that, but because the bottom's so soft, that's why I made it a bit yeah, longer. Yeah, probably, you'd think probably a third of it's yeah. probably buried, is it? It is, yeah. Well, right. I think so, I can only guess, yeah. really. I noticed there you've got um, the end trap soft tied on with a grinner. Um, your, I can't get them like that. Yours and Penning's grinners are always like super duper neat. How do you get everything as tidy as that? Well, you're not tying it right, are you? No, probably not, mate. No. Um, let pl plenty of practice, really, Dan. Right. Um, I've always used the, the grinner knot and uh, been carp fishing now for over 30 years, so it's you know, it's easy to tie for me. Yeah. And uh, neatness and tidiness is what, second nature. I've noticed that in a, a lot of the anglers I've done TV shows and stuff with, like, you know, every good angler you fish with, the, the finesse and the attention to detail is always there, yeah. always. And uh, it's, a, it's a big part of it, isn't it? Definitely. It is, yeah. I mean, the thing is, if you've got um, all your tackles as good as it can be, your rigs as t well tied as they can be, then the only variable is you. Yeah. So if you, if you make a mistake, it's down to you, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then we've got a bit of um, dark matter uh, gravel brown tubing right um, for anti tangle properties and to protect the fish right cool so a nice simple rig no no bits on it that don't need to be on it you can cast it 100 times and it's not going to tangle super sharp hook as well that's what's nailing yeah them. you don't need anything else wicked so there you have it a very simplistic setup very effective too you can cast it and cast it and cast it and it won't tangle so if you're experiencing tangles at any range or you're fishing at long range that's what damien recommends like a Hawaii 5 to me. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good skills. Look at this prehistoric beast. 52 pounds, caught in that really simple rig I showed you earlier. 20 pound end trap soft, size six choddy B, put in the right place. And this is what you get. Awesome.
I'm going to prepare another bait mix up now for what we're using at Lahore. Fortunately, there are hardly any nuisance fish. There's a few tench, but not many. There's certainly no bream, and there's no big roach or anything to give you any problems. So we're using little bits. The bait's been put in quite a tight area. And we're fishing all three rods very close together. So let's knock this up now then. So first of all, good old fashioned hemp. This one is cooked with tuna flakes in the jar, because it's actually cooked in the jar to keep it fresh. So a couple of those go in first of all. You'll remember I used to add tuna to my hemp now, but that's already cooked in it, which makes it even better. And then three tins of your cheap, as you like, sweet corn out of the supermarket. You can get this on deals sometimes and get it really, really cheap. And I buy this by the case. So three of those. Let's give that a nice mix up first of all. That on its own is a fantastic spod mix, but it will fly out the back of the spod. So we're going to stiffen it up with some boily. We're uh, fortunate here that the bailiff Rob baits up for you uh, once a day. So you manage to put a whole bucket in when he baits up and then weather permitting, we're re-spodding after we've had fish. At the moment, there's a horrendous crosswind. So there's no point trying to do it at the moment because you just won't get it out there. So the mix of boilies, if I show you that, that's the mix of boilies. So hardly any whole ones in there at all. Crushed up baits and half baits in there. And I've used two different tools for that. First of all, the crusher. That's been out quite a few years now. Blends boilies up in seconds by turning that. And then the most recent little gadget, which everybody has now got in their tackle box, I'm sure, is the cutter. Comes in three sizes, boilies get scooped up, straight into there, and it just cuts the boilies in seconds. So I cut probably a kilo and then crush a kilo up as well. And then in this case, we've actually done most of these ones in the blender because we knew we were going to be using loads of bits and pieces. So it makes short work of that. And you can see there, it's all stuck together. It doesn't look like boily as we know it, because we've added something to it. What we've basically done is got three tins of tuna in sunflower oil, and then a bit of water and a bit of salt, and blended it up with like a whisker that you would normally use in the kitchen. And that forms like a tuna milkshake. So it's really, really thin, smells really pungent. We then heat that up, just get it boiling, and then pour it onto the boilies. And over 24 hours, it soaks into the baits and just adds something extra to the baits. You can also use sunflower oil. You can use things like coconut milk, especially onto the cell, because that's got a coconutty smell as well. And what we're basically doing is getting that to draw into them so it releases out of the bait once it's out there. And when it's not too windy, because this is quite oily, what we've poured onto it, you can actually see oil coming up to the surface as the fish are chewing the baits, the oil's coming up, and you know you're going to get a bite. So we'll add a bit of that to there. In fact, I'll just pour that in. Just fill that bucket up. Now that weighs about 10 kilos altogether. And uh, we're putting one of these in about five, six o'clock in the evening every day. And then, uh, like I say, we're rebating with the spods, weather permitting, if we've had a couple of bites during the night or we're getting bites during the day. And uh, what we're trying to do is just keep the swim alive rather than just having that one bait in per day. Obviously, you need a good casting technique and the right kit to get it out there with a spod. But what will happen over a period of time is all the juice out of the hemp will draw into the boilies, make them even more spongy so you can force it down into the spod so you don't lose anything out the back and everything is dropping on the baited area. That's really important. You don't want loads of bait coming back from the baited area that's still in the spod when you're winding it in. So that is the mix that we're using. That will work absolutely anywhere. If you've got no nuisance fish around, that's what I recommend. Fella, get in the net. Yes, get in. Oh, get in. It's a long one. Oh, wicked. That is a well decent common. You'll see all the way through the DVD, all the guys on it are absolutely obsessed with fish care, keeping the fish absolutely pristine. This is rule number one. Undo the net while the fish is still in the water and then slide the fish into the wave sling, which we've already zeroed the scales on. 
slide the fish into that and lift it out of the water in the wasting and that stops any risk of ripping the mouth just unzip that or bending any fins back or anything else that you can do if you're bringing the fish out of the water in the net okay so this is one of the large euro way slings from tracker the retainer slings that just floats on the surface just slide the fish into it like so the whole net goes inside as well and then what i'll do is without putting too much tension and i'll just check the fins are flat against the fish's body not bent back the other way they're nice and flat both sides which they are cool so now we can come out of the water Forty pounds of pristine Lahore Common, taken on a very, very simplistic rig, very effective too, of course, and very, very easy to tie. So we're going to do some pictures of this fella, and then show you how it's done. This is the rig that I'm using for the extreme range fishing we're doing here. Very similar to Damien's in that there's no gubbins going on there. It's stripped down as much as humanly possible, so there's less to go wrong. So starting at the hook end, the old faithful IB pop-up corn, that just gives the hook bait a little bit of buoyancy, a little bit of colour, and some extra attraction from a smell point of view. That's a real winner, that one. Everywhere we've taken it, it's caught really well. That's on top of the old faithful cell dumbbell, and I've soaked these in a little bit of the sunflower oil that comes out of a tin of tuna. That just soaks into it, darkens it down a little bit, it and makes it even more attractive then moving down we've got just a standard hair rig what I call the claw rig so I've got a rig ring on the hook there so that the hair leaves the hook roughly opposite where the barb should be it's a barbless rule on this water so I've crushed mine down to nothing if I take the uh, the little cap off the captor there you can see just how sharp that hook is that's a size 4 curve so quite a big hook with quite a small bait, but I like that. It snags really quickly in the fish's mouth. That's finished off with a bit of the medium-sized clay shrink tube angled in really aggressively, and that helps that barbless hook stay in place. And on all these lakes that have got barbless rules, a lot of people suffer hook pulls. Putting that little bit of extra shrink tube on there will stop that happening. And also, when you're playing the fish, you need to pull really hard. People don't play their fish hard enough, and the fish shake their head, and the hook comes out. So a super sharp hook like that, coupled with a bit of shrink tube, will stop the hook pulls almost completely. And the hook link itself, that's a new one as well. That's the end trap semi-stiff. I've stripped a little bit back by the hook, so the hook can lift up and turn and catch hold. But the rest of it has got the coating on it, and that's going to help prevent the tangles. And then a couple of inches down from that, I've got a small size sinker with a bit of the dark matter putty moulded round it. That's just to help everything lay flat on the bottom. It's very soft out there. The lead is plugging in. So having that little bit of extra weight, just make sure the bit near the hook is sitting flat on the bottom. And whether I'm using a, a semi-stiff hook link like this or a really stiff one like the hybrid stiff, I still put that bit on there and it just keeps it all laying flat. And then at the other end, I've got a hinge created by a ring swivel. I've just used a four turn half blood knot in the 30 pound semi stiff to that. I've got some of the dark matter tube in there, just enough to stop the rig tangling. It's probably about 18 inches there of tubing. Again, very, very important, I think, when you're fishing at long range, by having rig tubing on, you're making the line behind the lead heavier and stiffer, and that stops the hook link from wrapping around it. So if you want to fish at long distance, that's what I recommend. Another huge Lahore mirror. This one coming in at 54 pounds. Falling again to the end trap soft, choddy hook, cell dumbbell, and the all important plastic IB hook bait. Dan's gonna run you through what we're doing and how we're doing it with those plastic baits. This is part of the plastic hook baits range, basically the dumbbells. So we've got three sizes. You've got eight mil, 12 mil, and 16 mil, and they're available in two buoyancies. So slow sinking, which means the hook will lay flat, 
and the bait will just hover above and then super buoyant pop up that holds the hook up off the bottom if you've got a counterbalance and then we've got four flavors so first of all yellow ib that's ali's favorite that's a blend of four or five different fruity flavors and then the fishy fish we've designed that one for fishing over trout pellets so you can see there the color is like a washed out trout pellet and that's got three all-time brilliant fish flavors the next one down squid and fruit a classic combination that's caught us loads of carp all over the world and then the last one is my favorite banoffee in the white color so that's the range and if we look at the rigs they're fished on first of all the largest one in the range is 16 mil white banoffee that's a slow sinker that one fished with a size four curve it might look like a big hook there but that's balanced really well the hook's going to sit flat and the bait's just going to hover above and then the next one down we've got a pop-up eight mil there fished with a 14 mil boilie so that's still going to sink but that that pop up there is just going to take away the weight of the hook and help it to go up in the fish's mouth and of course it's going to give you more attraction because you've got all the smell of that IB coming out as well as the pop up. And then the next one just as again like the size 4 fished exactly the same sort of claw style a bit of shrink tube on it little rig ring and again the hook's going to sit flat and that fruity squid is going to sit just above it. These are brilliantly slow sinkers. If you're fishing over spod mix like we are now and all little bits and pieces, having that hook laying flat and having the bait just hovering above is perfect. It's a bright colour, it stands out amongst all the other stuff, but it's not frightening. You haven't got the hook up off the bottom to scare the fish and they come in and grab that one first. And then the last one incorporates the plastic corn. That's the pop-up IB, that one, fish with a cell dumbbell. Again, the hook's going to lay flat and it's just going to hover above it just making it stand out from all those bits that we've been baiting up with. That's probably been the most successful at Lahore at the moment. So they're the plastic baits we're using in the fishing in this situation. Obviously there are pop-ups to be used in weed as well, and maize and corn, and I'm sure we'll be using those later on in the DVD. Well, we are into another early morning Lahore long range carp. Um, and what we're going to do, hopefully, if I get this one in, um, is go through the correct way to get them out of the water, weigh them up and photograph them, because uh, that's when the damage happens, when people get the fish out of the water. Um, you can snap fins, take scales off, rip their mouth, and you've seen us uh, using the wastelings to get the fish out of the water. We're going to talk you through all of that because we want these beautiful, beautiful fish to stay pristine the whole time. Um, just trying to lead this fish in away from the other lines. Because we're fishing our lines so tight here, we're trying to get the fish to uh, actually go under them. Right, so that feels quite heavy when I keep in contact with it. Uh, the other lines are, uh, the fish is reasonably close now, but I, I can see it's, it's underneath the other lines, so big chunky Lahore mirror another one on the IQ 2D rig come on fella easy does it easy does it in you go in you go got him wicked another one on the IQ Right, I've already zeroed the waist sling. This is one of the Armo retention slings. Absolutely brilliant. The water just drains straight through these. So I've got it wet, zeroed it on the scales, and I'm now going to transfer the fish in the net and then into the waist sling. So let's just break the net down. I just left the fish in the edge while I was doing all that. And uh, it was perfectly fine. Important not to rush everything at this point. Just take it nice and slow. So just drop that in the water, that's going to float. And I'm just going to get down and slide the fish into it. It's important when you're rolling the net up, don't roll the line into it because you can drag the hook out of the fish's mouth and rip the mouth. So let's just slide that in like so. There he goes. Into the waist sling. Perfect. Oh. Okay, that's all good. I'm just checking his fins are nice and flat against his body. I'll just do that with my hands as well. Just check there. Yep. Yep. 
I'll just zip that front up. Okay, get that out of the way. So the two together. And over to the mat. There we go. Also guys, if you can keep the rod off the floor, there's less chance of somebody else treading on it. So, let's see what we've got. Look at the thickness of that. Uh, the hook is still in. If you want to see this hook hold on that IQD rig. I don't know if you can see that in there. Absolutely nailed. Let's just take that out. There she comes. Nice and easy with a barbless. And we'll get that out of the way. Okay, I'm gonna take my watch off first because you don't want to scratch the fish with that. Just roll my sleeves up a little bit. Right, I want to get him out of the net and into the sling. So roll him over towards me. Right, mate. And I'm just going to lift him up and get the net out of the way. There we go. Like so. Okay, zip the ends up. He's on. That one's filling the sling, mate. Yeah. It's a big one, mate, I tell you. Right. So, put my foot on the end of the, the way bar, and then it's important to hold the way bar at the very top so it doesn't bend it. Just keep him over the sling. It's a big one, mate. Yeah. 53, 53 and a half, I'll give you that. Nice. Wicked. Right, back down onto the sling. You'll notice as well that we've not lifted the fish right up off the ground, just above the unhooking mat, just to get the reed in, and then the fish is back down again. And also, the way bar, I'm holding it at the very top. It's a mistake a lot of people make, they hold them here, and they end up snapping at the top, and the fish can crash down, as well as breaking your way bar. And if you haven't got one of these Signet ones, I strongly recommend them, they are really, really good. Wet my hands right up. Before I pick him up. Right, before I pick him up, I'm just going to check. I mean, the hook the hook was perfectly in. There's no damage to the mouth whatsoever. I'm just checking that now. And I would use the carp care kit if there was a tear or anything. There's one for the mouth and one for the body. Just put a little bit on the, on the hook mark if it was a tear. I checked the body as well. And if there was a sore or something there, then I'd just dry it off with a bit of kitchen towel and apply the body part of the carp care kit to it. Just squeeze that on and just rub it in and let it soak in for a little bit before I put the fish back. But... This is absolutely perfect, so it doesn't need it. So slide my hand down the head of the fish, get around that fin. That's going to help you to grip it and hold the fish still. And then the other one, my thumb just comes down there and sort of grips the spine of the anal fin. And then up she comes nice and straight. There you go, the fish is not rolling forwards or backwards. My right hand is supported by my knee. And uh, even though it's 54 pound, I mean, it's, it's playing for the cameras, this one, it's staying nice and still. But uh, that's the way to pick them up. Slide your hand down the head, get your thumb around the anal fin and then pick them up like that. And if it starts to flip, I just roll it back onto my forearms like that. And then you can lower it back down onto the mat. Sometimes when they flip, it's because it's obviously dark in the water. It's very bright out here. And I think it's startling for the fish. And also if the fish is very cold and your hands are warm, it's gonna feel very hot to them. So they're the sort of things, if it's flipping a lot, you can roll the sling back over the top of it, just darken it down. And then always make sure, obviously, you're applying water to the fish all the time, especially if it's hot in the summer. So let's lift him up again, slide it down his head, round that peck there, 
and then up she comes and nice and straight perfect to apply a bit more water obviously make sure that's out of the photograph just off to the side there and then you want to be checking your background so obviously you've got lovely green trees behind it's a little way behind me and the camera's set on the portrait setting which is the face when you're turning the dial around it's the face setting and what that will do is blur the background so it makes the front really pin sharp and that bit a little bit blurred and it just makes everything jump off the photograph so lifting all up again chill just rolling back towards me if they are flipping a lot if you put your hand over his eye just darken him off a bit that sometimes helps oh chill a little bit more water okay and there she is So before I transfer him back into the water, I'm just going to check his fins are flat against his body. That's flat under there as well. Last thing you want is the fin bent back. If you pick up 54 pounds of fish, you can easily snap a fin. Just make sure everything else is nice and in line. Now I'm going to transfer it into the water. Damien's already waiting in the water. I'm going to put my chesties on and do a couple of returning shots. We're going to talk maggots now, maggot fishing, with someone who's done a hell of a lot of it. And uh, it's not just a small fish method, is it, mate? No, mate. I've caught loads of good carp on it, up to over 40 pounds. Right. Several 30s. Yeah, no, it's a brilliant bait. And do you use it all year round? No, I tend to use it in the winter time when the silverfish are not moving about so much and they're not right. going to pick your bait up. Right, OK. And any, any lake? Doesn't matter where yeah, you... Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I've caught from shallow lakes, deep lakes, big lakes, small lakes, anywhere right. really, anywhere where you're willing to give it a go. Right, okay. Um, and when do you switch in onto a maggot? Is it like something you just go in with straight away or do you wait until things are not working with other things? What, well, what makes you do it? I, I first started using them on the Syndicate Lake when uh, I was using normal boilies, using the normal methods that most people use. And I thought, I said to my mate, I think, you know, maggots will make a difference over here. So the next trip came down and it completely changed my fishing. Really? It went from zero to hero over the right. You know, over a, like a month period, I caught five five fish, I think it was. Right. You know, and, and on a difficult water. Really difficult water. Yeah. Right. It, you know, from November to December, in hideous conditions. Right. You know, it totally changed my season. Right. So, how many are you putting in then? Uh, on that particular lake, I was taking two or three gallons when right. I was going um, for an overnight session. I would at least have eight pints. Right. Okay. Know. Which is quite a lot of money, isn't it? You know, yeah, it's it a lot of money. You, what are they? Two fifty, three quid a, a pint now. Something like that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So a lot of money, but it can transform your results completely. Right. You know, th th it's money well spent using maggots. Right. Um, and if you don't use them at the end of the session, you can always freeze them. So you can, dead maggots are always good bait. Right. Okay. And you use them at Chillum. It's a very good effect oh, with yeah. Adam. Yeah. Yeah. Had a brilliant session at Chillum with Adam. Um, we got the swim going. And the fish just started coming, you know, and it was just, just a mega session. And that was just springtime, wasn't it? Was it late, late it was, winter, early spring? Yeah, it was April, but it was like fishing in December. It was right. freezing cold, windy, raining, you know, horrible conditions. Right. But, you know, after a day of getting the bait in the swim, they turned up and they just kept coming. Right, so show us the rig then that you fish over the top of it. Right, well, this is, um, this is my standard sort of maggot presentation, which has got 22 maggots on a... On, on a ball. Right, why 22? Well, it's just a magic number. It was yeah. 11 <laughs> 11 from Mr. Dove. Right. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's, it's a good size for the size of the hook that I'm fishing with, which is a size 8 curve. Right. I attach the maggots using a tiny little swivel in there right. so that when the rig's on the bottom, if they're moving about a bit, when it, as they twist and turn, they don't turn the hook over. So right, they don't okay. twist the hook up. I like that, very crafty. Yeah. So they can roll backwards and forwards on the bottom and they're not moving the rig around. Exactly. Right. You know, which you can sometimes wind in and they've gone around the hair, around, right. the, around the hook. Right. Um, just a standard KD setup. Right, very so that's simple. not this knot, one turn, pull the hair out the exactly. way, carry on whipping yep. down the hook and then back through the eye. And you get great separation, it's like a claw. So you come down, I've got two centimetres of uh, stripped off braid. Right. Further down, I've got a little sinker. Yep. With some dark matter putty over the top. Right, that's not some dark matter putty, is it? That is a proper blob. That's a big matter. blob, yeah. That's so something... what, what does that do? Well, Adam Penning showed it to me, and, and, and it, it's basically just pulling the hook down. Right. You know, when they're, when they're feeding on maggots and you're fishing it tight, they're not moving very quickly. Yep. So it's helping the hook find purchase in the bottom lip. 
You can see it doing it there. As soon yeah. as you take any tension out of the hook link, it's wanting to drop down and yeah, pull the hook it's like down. A claw. You right. Get, you know, it works really well. Right. I've got fairly standard length hook link here, probably 10, 11 inches. Right. And that's end trap soft, is it? End trap soft, 15 pounds. Right. And I, you know, I'll try and fish smaller hooks. Certainly nothing bigger than an eight. Right. You know, tens maybe, and just a few less maggots if I need to, just to a standard, you know, hybrid leg clip setup. Right. So the rest of it, you're not changing really. I like I like the thing with the with the swivel on there that they you know they can move around and not spin the hook. That's that's really good. That. But the rest of it is pretty much the same as what anybody else would use. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, the, the one one thing you, sh you should do is uh, put, tie a bit of PVA tape around the hair and the hook just right. to stop it tangling. Because sometimes you can get end up with a maggot on the hook. Right. Okay. If you're not careful. And what about bags? Do you use PVA over the top? Uh, rarely, but you right. can you can use it. I mean, generally I fish at range. You know, I've been, the lakes I've been fishing. It's at 80 to 100 yards in right. pretty wild conditions, so right. a bag of maggots isn't the one when you're trying to get it tight. Right, um, okay. But on the smaller lakes, yeah, they, you know, it's a brilliant little method. Right, okay. One last thing, when do you put more in? When would you introduce more maggots after that, after that first initial feed? Well, if I've had any action, right. if there's anything showing, if you think you should have caught something, then maybe cleared you out. Um, if the small fish are active, then I, I'll just put, you know, three or four spodfuls out, just bring it in and get it in the swim and it just livens the swim up again. Right, okay. So if you feel you should have caught and you haven't, put a few more in. If you've caught and you think you can get away with putting more bait in and not scaring them, exactly. do that as well. But once they're on the feed, you know, you don't be shy with the bait. You just right. keep keep feeding it and you'll keep catching them. Right, wicked. Well, words of wisdom from Mr. Clark. Use me in the winter time if there's not many small fish about and it can transform your results. We've been using leg clips for the entire session and making sure the leads dump on all the bites. Because we're fishing at such a long range, we need the leads to come off and the fish to come up in the water. Really important. We're going to look at some of my alternative rigs for fishing at long range. They're very good for anti-tangle and they're very aggressive at hooking the fish as well. So the first one, not dissimilar to the rig I had made with a 30 pound end trap semi stiff, but this is 20 pound hybrid stiff. So quite a stiff coated material. You can see there in that long length, it's not really that stiff. I've used this down to sort of three or four inches long on a hard gravel bottom, but because that lead's burying out there, I've extended it so it's probably 10 inches long, something like that. Still with the bit of putty on it, you can see there to hold everything down on the bottom, just in case that lead really is plugged in and the hook link's sticking up high out the bottom, that bit of putty will help the bit near the hook to lay flat on the bottom. The setup's exactly the same on the end, so I've got a size four cap to curve, made barbless. The ring on the shank of the hook, just leaving the hook roughly where the barb should be. And then a bit of shrink tube aggressively angled inwards to help it flip over and catch hold. And then our old faithful cell dumbbell there tipped off with a bit of IB corn. That's what's been doing the business. And on the other end there, you see down by the ring swivel, I've actually crimped it rather than tying a knot. And crimping with the small size crimp actually gives a much stronger breaking strain than if you were tying a knot in it. And it's very, very easy to do. And of course, you can get your hook links exactly the right length every time. So that's a good alternative to the end trap semi stiff. And then moving down onto the next one. This is a rig I've used for many, many years. See very few people using this one. It's basically mono straight through. This is IQ2 in 15 pounds breaking strain tied onto the hook with my favourite whipping knot. You could use a knotless knot as well, but you see there, what I've done is I've cut the end of the knot off. So what would normally be the hair is cut away, and then the hair is tied onto the hook using a bit of braid. In this case, I've used 30 pound armour cord, but you could use any decent braid, quite a short hair. And then I've got one of those dumbbells on there with a bit of plastic corn, and that's just gonna sit nice and flat on the bottom. And then moving down, I've still got my sinker on there and a bit of putty to help everything sit flat on the bottom. And at the other end, I've simply got a ring swivel, nothing to get in the way, nothing to get tangled, and I've just tied onto that with a four turn half blood knot. And a little trick on those, wet it, and then pull the tag end tight first, and then tighten the hook link, and you won't kink that fluorocarbon at all. And that turns over and catches hold really aggressively, especially coupling it with a size four curve like that. That's really good, and because it's mono all the way down, it almost never tangles, which is very, very important when we're chucking a long way. And then the last one, this is the one I've caught most of my big fish on over the last couple of years. Again, 15 pound IQ2 straight through, but you can see there on the hook, I've actually tied a D. So I've tied my favourite whipping knot first, then put a micro rig swivel on there, and then I've tied the knotless knot to form the D. 
Next on goes the sinker and a little bit of putty around it to hold everything flat. And then at the other end, I've got it tied with a four turn half blood knot again. So essentially very similar to the last rig, but that D basically helps the bait and the hook to separate in the fish's mouth and the hook can turn and catch hold really quickly. And where I've got one of the tiny micro rig swivels on there, it means the bait can turn without turning the hook. So that means the hook turns very aggressively because it hasn't got to turn the bait as well. The only downside to this one, I like to tie it up with PVA tape or put a little bit of rig foam on it just to make sure that that bait doesn't fly around on the D and end up hooking itself on the cast. But any mono hook link like that or one of the coated hook links with hardly any braid exposed will cast really well and hardly ever tangle. So if you've got a fish a long way out, that's what I recommend. Well, ladies and gents, it's taken me 10 years to do it, but I've beaten my PB common. Um, one of the reasons we came to Lahore, there's massive commons in here. Um, this is a very big fish, not a monster for Lahore, but at 52 pounds, it beats my personal best by four ounces. So uh, we're gonna get this fella out and get some pictures done. How about that for an inch perfect common? 52 pounds on the dot. Caught him at half past six this morning on the left hand rod. Just a little while after it got light, just a little while ago, um, and he was on that Bonoffi hook bait, my favourite Bonoffis, on the IQD rig that I showed you. How about that for proof of the pudding? Absolutely wicked. Well, well pleased with this one. It's nice to beat that PB after such a long time. As I said, that's why we've come to Lahore. Um, believe it or not, they're over 20 pound bigger than this in here. Um, some of the biggest commons are 75 plus. So uh, you never know, we might nail one of those before we go home. But for me, I'm already completely satisfied. Wicked. Another then, mate? Yes, mate. I'm an offy again. He kited right round. Well, I'm trying to get him to kite away from the other line, so pull him right, I'm trying to get him to kite left. But with this wind, yeah, he's, he's doing it. With this wind, it's pushing the fish that way as well, isn't it, as you're playing them? Yeah. So answer me this, yeah, you, obviously we're in a privileged position. We can, we can use whatever kit we want from Daiwa. But if you were on a budget, what would you, what's the most important bit of the casting kit to spend your money on? Rods, I reckon. Yeah? Definitely, yeah. I mean, the thing with Daiwa rods, and I've used them, well, forever, I've always used Daiwa kit. But from when we had the amorphous rods back in the 90s, yeah. you know, they, they, they were a turning point because of the lack of torque in the blank, so accuracy of casting was very yeah. easy um, and distance was just made everything much easier to cast a long range. And the way things are going now, I mean, they're managing to put into a longbow, which is a fraction of the price of an Infinity, they're managing to put the same sort of stuff that you would have seen in an Amorphous 10 years ago, aren't they? Yeah. if not yep. better. Yeah, I mean, they're very similar rods, really similar. And those, um, those 12 foot, three and three quarter rods, that came from that day we spent out with Nori, the rod builder or rod designer. They're um, they're so close to an infinity now. Those long bows. Definitely, the rods more important, but you know there are reels at every budget point now, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, them, them new cross casts for the money, uh, they're just ridiculous. What you're getting, you know, long spool, brilliant line lay, and everything. You know, and they're a fraction of what we had to pay years exactly, ago yeah. when we bought SS 3000s yeah. and. There's no excuse now for not being able to get out there. No, no, but I do see a lot of people, they spend a load of money on baziers and the rods have just haven't got the backbone exactly, in them, yeah. you know? And that, that's definitely the thing to update, is the rod first. He's just coming around nicely now. In you come, get in the net, get in the net, yes. 
but off he strikes again. And there he is, a super, super clean 34 pounder. And as we've said, if you're gonna spend money on long range kit, get the rods first and the reel second. And if you can't stretch to an infinity, don't ignore the 12 foot three and three quarter longbow because they are one hell of a rod. This is my long range marker float kit. In fact, it's my marker float kit for everywhere. I can cast this, well, I've had some cast intuition recently and I can get this 170 yards. Um, and we talk about casting techniques in a minute. But first of all, the rod, this is a longbow DF spod and marker. So it's the sort of softer of the two. There's a spod rod as well, which is even stiffer, but this still is very, very stiff. And that's important with a marker rod. That it's very stiff. One, it'll cast a long way. And two, when you're dragging the lead back along the bottom, the stiffer the rod, the more vibrations you feel. So as you can see, they're built like a normal longbow fishing rod. So very, very sexy build on it. Very minimal, 50 mil butt ring, going up to a 40, 30, 20, 16, and a 16 mil tip ring. So the line absolutely flies off of there. That's really important. And also a really long handle, that's really important for leverages, getting the rod tip moving quickly. There's nothing worse than having a marker rod that's too soft and it's got too short a handle, too small eyes, and you can't get the marker float any distance. And then moving down onto the reel, a bit extravagant really for a marker reel, but the important thing about this, it's the same reel as the fishing reel. So if I'm counting the number of turns to a spot, it's gonna say it's 105 turns of this, it's 105 turns of the fishing reel as well. And that's something I use in my fishing a lot. If I find a good area, then I'll count the number of turns, write it down in my Blackberry and keep it forever. So I know if I go back in the same swim, casting at the same far bank marker, 105 turns, I'm back on the money again. That's loaded up with 30 pound floating braid and a 50 pound armor cord leader. And that's really, really important. 50 pound armor cord, one, it's very, very strong to take the force of the cast, but also it's quite thick. And that means that this bit on the end doesn't tangle when I cast it out. Some people experience this lot tangling on the cast. So let's just put this down and show you what happens if you don't cast it hard enough. What happened, because that's a big float, obviously it's very buoyant, which is a big advantage, but because it is a big float, it pushes back up the line and then can do that on the cast and then it locks itself in position and it won't come up. So by casting it harder and lower, it keeps the whole thing together and then it won't tangle on the cast. And that 50 pound armor cord really helps that. And to talk to you about the float system itself, so we've got the drop zone marker float there, great big flight on the top of it, which is really important at long range, small marker floats are really difficult to see that helps a great deal. And now you can buy separate flights for this, so you can get black flights and replacement orange flights as well. If the light conditions like we've got today, it's very bright out there, a black float would be perfect. When the light starts to drop, then you want to have a lighter coloured float on, so one of the orange ones will stand out better. And then I've got the bead that comes in the pack with the float, and then also one of those stems. That just keeps everything up off the bottom, keeps it away from weed and stuff. And I actually think it casts better with the stem. And then on the end of the stem, this time I've put a four ounce distance lead that I've just cut the swivel off of. And then that's just on there with one of our stick clips. And then over the top of that, I've got a helicopter sleeve that just neatens everything up, keeps it all nice and tight together, stops anything tangling. So that's the marker float setup. Obviously I'm not using a marker on this particular session because on the haul there are markers out in the lake already for you to aim at. So this is what I would use if I was gonna start a session and I didn't know where I'd be fishing. A week-long session like this, I'd find a spot first and just concentrate on that spot over the course of the week and get the bites coming. Now let's talk about actually baiting up. This is my long-range spot setup. So let's go to the front of the swim and I'll talk you through long-range spotting. Again, the rod is the most important thing as it is with any casting. This is a Longbow DF long-range spot. This came from a day where we went out with one of the Japanese rod builders, showed him what long range spotting was, and he designed this fella. And this is proper pokey, this one. Over five pound test curve, but you need it when you're fishing a long way out. Big rings again, all the way down it. That's really, really important. And a long handle as well, built exactly the same 
there's the longbow fishing rod so it looks really smart as well but it does the job and that is so important i see most people the cheapest rod is their spod rod and they, they wonder why they can't get the distance so important to have something that's got the backbone in it and we'll put that spot out a long way. This is the Daiwa Emblem Spod Reel, made for the job, great big spool on it, a really kind line clip, that's really important if you can see that there. That's what we're putting the line under to stop the spot at exactly the right distance. And that's loaded with 30 pound Daiwa Tournament Braid, absolutely brilliant stuff this, thin as cotton, really, really strong, goes off the spool brilliantly, but you have got to respect it. So keep splashing it with water while you're spotting and that will stop too many loops coming off together and causing what we call braid carnage. And that's attached to a 30 pound armor cord leader. Not the 50 that I'm using on the marker setup. 30 is more than strong enough for me. The most important thing, if you can see just above the reel there, joining the two together with a four turn water knot creates a tiny, tiny knot and that never catches on the rings at all. So that's a perfectly balanced setup. And if I combine that with one of our Sky Raider spods, that's tapered towards the back, really buoyant nose cone on it, but all of the weight is in the front of the spod and that's really important. That makes it fly true and really long. It's a little bit lighter than the Skyliner spod, which was our original one, a little bit smaller surface area, and that's what makes it go further. And then there's one of these called a Skywinder, which has got no holes right up to the fins. And that's for if you're putting boilies out, you'd fill it with boilies, then dunk it in the water, fill it with water to stop the boilies coming out. And that's what I was using in that situation or if I'm fishing with maggots. But in this situation, we're fishing a particle mix. So I'm scooping up sort of to the top of the spod, pressing it down with my thumb. So it's all compressed into the bottom end of the spod. That's really important. Stops it wobbling about in flight and then out she goes. And then the technique for spotting, you want to be moving your body. First of all, your weight starts on your back foot. So the, your, the tip of your toe, there's almost no weight on at all. Your arms are fully extended and you're really gripping the end of the rod with your left hand, if, if you're right handed. The rod's as far back as you can get it. So it's almost level. The spot's almost dragging along the floor. And as you come through, the weight transfers onto your front foot you're pulling with that left hand as much as you can and punching the spot out there. That's really important to get movement of the body. So you start off on the back foot and go through into the front foot. If you're just casting with the top half of your body, you're never gonna get as far. And make sure those arms are fully extended right up in the air and the rod tip is as far back as you can get it. So the rod is level, if anything, pointing slightly backwards. The spot should just be skirting the floor and then you come through all the power, pushing your body weight through onto the front foot as well. And if you're going straight overhead, the spot should go lovely and straight. Obviously we've got a bit of a crosswind today, so I'll be heading into it a little bit and then getting the spot just to fade over and go close to that pole. So, so let's get into that. We've got both our buckets here in front of us. That's really important. I'm just scooping up to the top of the spot, squeezing it down with my thumb, as I say. That just gets the excess off and then roughly half the length of the rod. That's what, how far the spot should be dropping down. Got my nice neoprene finger stall on. The weight goes onto my back foot. Rod tip all the way back and then out. Dink. That's just hit the clip at 130 yards. And if you keep practicing, keep practicing, you'll get it to go just as far as that. It's just technique and having the right kit. If I can do it, you can do it. Got one in, son? Yeah. Feels big. Feels like a nice one, yeah. Oh, good. He's kiting right, isn't he? Yeah, he's kiting well right. Well, fortunately, Rob's not fishing, so. Uh, Impressive curve in that infinity, mate. Yeah, I know. Let's talk, uh, while we're doing this, we talk 13 footers because you use them a lot, don't you? Yeah, all the time. Um, you know, and it's fair to say, you're not a monster of a man, are you? No. You know, but you can still cast them a long way. Um, what made you use 13 footers? Well, I found it a lot easier casting a 13 foot rod. I could cast with the same effort much further than with a 12 footer. Right. And uh, the original Infinities that we got, 
probably 10 years ago. It's just such a nice rod for playing fish on. I just use them all the time. Yeah. And uh, you uh, couple yours with a bazier, don't you? Yeah, I've got a set of baziers, yeah. I yeah. mean, they're the top of the range reel. But to be fair, I don't think they're, you know, you, you, you gain any benefit from using the black baziers. Right. Jewelry then? Jewelry, yeah. Jewelry for yeah. carp anglers. Yeah. But we, the boys love the toys, don't they? They do, yeah. Mate, Big... This is uh, proper going around this corner. I think you might have to get me them, them easy on waders. Got him! Come on! Yes! Wicked! <laughs> That's a good one. And this is why we come to Itang Lahore. Massive mirror carp like this, 58 pounds and just a few ounces, taken at 130 yards on the old faithful 13 foot, three and three quarter infinities and the Bazier combo. And uh, on that all important cell hook bait, fished with a little tiny bit of the IB pop-up corn, just to give it a little bit of color and a little bit of extra flavor. Wicked. And we're gonna do some still shots now. And then once we get this fella back, we're going to talk to you about bite indication. Okay, Damo. Oh. Fishing in this kind of situation shows you just how good a bite indication system I've got on here. The Delkim and Stow bobbing together is absolutely perfect. Normally you would have seen me in any of the other DVDs fishing very, very slack lines. In this situation, because it's a big lake, it's only shallow and there's lots of undertow, you have to fish bowstring tight lines. If you slacken off, you'll just get a massive bow in them. All the lines can knit together. When you pull up into a fish, all the lines come up together. It's just absolutely horrendous. And all the guys who are really successful on here, all fish really, really tight lines. So we're doing exactly the same as them. The reason these stoves are not going off, no matter what wind we're getting, I mean at the moment we've got a brisk northerly, it's been almost gale force since we've been here and the buzzers have still not been going off and that's because they're set on the right sensitivity. So I've got them on plus, which means it doesn't take so much to actually set them off, the vibration is picked up quicker, but they're only on three to four sensitivity. So if I move this, you see there, there's not a lot of movement to that at all, but since I've been talking, the wind hasn't set them off at all. So let's imitate a take. There you go, so there's quite a lot of bleeps to that, but the most important thing there is the stow bobbin has fallen away, and because it's semi-fixed to the line, if I attach that again, rather than like a normal bobbin where the line will slide through it, it's actually semi-fixed. As it gets pulled forwards, it will unclip itself, and even if the line's only moved a fraction, you'll still know which rod's got the fish on it, and that is really, really important. A lot of people have written about these saying, oh, they're only any good for slack line fishing. They're actually designed for exactly this situation fishing very very tight lines and unclipping themselves and giving the best bite indication you can possibly get. You'll see there as well I've added the extra weights onto them that's if we get a drop back because we're fishing tight sometimes you do get drop backs and if I just imitate that you can see there I'm getting loads of bleeps on the Delkim and that extra weight is just helping everything to pull down and if I let that back up again you can see just how tight that line is. I mean all three rods literally are fished within six foot even though we're fishing 130 yards out, all the bait goes out very, very close together, gets all the fish to feed in a very small area, and that's how you amass a big hit. You can see now, just while I'm talking, the wind sprung up again, no false bleeps on them whatsoever. Occasionally I've had a coot go through the lines and it set them off, but because the clutches are tight, it hasn't taken any line, the bobbin stayed on, 
and everything's just set perfect. And it's so, so important when fishing at these sort of distances, in these sort of conditions, to not get false bleeps, but know when you've got a fish on the end is absolutely imperative, and this combination does exactly that. There are two sets of Daiwa waders that I use regularly. These are the breathable top end ones that if you're going to wear waders all the time and you're in and out of the water all the time, this is what I'd recommend. They're not the easiest ones to put on, but once you've got them on, you don't sweat or anything in them. And they come with great big boots, like big Herman Munster boots to stop you slipping on rocks and stuff. So if you're going to fish rivers and you're looking at a quiver tip or fly fishing or whatever, these are the ones I'd recommend. If you've got to get them on quickly, then there's a much cheaper version that you can roll down so the boots are exposed. You can have them in the front of your bivvy. Just literally put your feet into them as you get your bite. Because they're so big and baggy, you can pull them up around you really quickly and then you're out to the rods. And if you've got to get in the water to net a fish, which I have to regularly, they're the ideal ones to use. So top end ones if you've got to live in them and cheaper ones if you're just putting them on to land a fish. Oh, is he taking line at long range? Yeah, it feels really heavy, mate. I've only got one rod out. I'm that good, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> the old wind's dropping a little bit now as well, yeah. isn't it? God. It's feel, yeah? Feel, yeah. It's got the feel about it. Well, for a man who's had an 80 pounder, if you say it feels big, I believe you. Oh, that sun's proper bright, isn't it? Mm. Real slow take, that one. Yeah. Just on the cell again, tipped off. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that's your favourite mainline bait or not? Uh, possibly, yeah, that and Active 8. Yeah. You know, they're two baits you can take anywhere. I thought you'd say Active, definitely. And, and to be honest, yeah, Active doesn't get to use that much. Well, I don't see many people using it anymore. No, it's always the, the in vogue one, isn't it? The hot, the latest hot bait. Se well, cell has been the one, hasn't it? Yeah, cell has, yeah. Oh my God. Honestly, this feels enormous. Probably be a 25 pounder hooked in the tail. So active is your, your favourite of all, is it? I reckon, yeah. As a bait that you could take anywhere in the world to yeah. catch carp on, that would be the one. And, I, and I've caught a lot of fish on that. Although, to be fair, I, you know, I've used mainline bait since, well, 1991, I think. And I could probably say I caught the first big carp on it back in yeah. the day. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I've used them ever since. Um, I'd use any of their freezer baits. Yeah, I would, Not definitely. Too Every one I've used, I've caught on, to be honest. I just use whatever they say use. But, uh I think my favourite cell now, just because I've had so many on it in the yeah. last couple of years, you know. And you can fish it summer, winter, whatever, yeah. you know. Now we're, we're obviously putting loads of bits out here, but that's, that's not your fishing all the time, is it? You, you're using whole boilies on yeah, some Yes, on some, some lakes, yeah. I mean, to be fair, in the last couple of years, and I think it's fair to say your fishing's changed more to boilies um, from, from a particle yeah, it depends on the lake you fish. Yeah. You know, if you fish a lake that's got loads of nuisance fish in it, then you need to be fishing whole boilies, don't you? Um, this is serious, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, feels it, yeah. Love the sound of this. The, yeah, the, the old lion singing, singing in the breeze, yeah. you know, it's a heavy one. It's a rod bending, man. Yeah, wow. It's really holding its ground. Well, Bridget's the biggest one in here, isn't it? Yeah, well, Rob thinks it's bigger. There's one that's not been out for a couple of years, so knowing you, you'll catch it. <laughs> we aim to please, Daniel. Yeah. So what, what, little, what little tips and tricks can you give people for if they're, if they're boily fishing? What, what extra little things have you done to um, have an edge over other people? Well, I think one of the biggest edges that I've seen you do, is, you know, is adding the, uh, some of the oils out of the fishes, you know, the tuna oil to your hook baits, dosing them up a little bit. Um, I tend with cell, I tend to dry it out a little bit if I'm fishing with the big ones, you know, where you want to put them out with a throwing stick. Yep. Because they can, can, they can break up mid-air. Yep. Um, I think, you, you know, I, I, I personally like using very fresh bait, you know, I don't tend to refreeze it. Right. Um, if I do, then I'll use that for putting, you know, baiting up. Right. When I'm not fishing. Right. Okay. Rather than waste it. Yep. Um, so you know, I always try and keep the bait really cold. Right. And frozen. Um, so using it, putting it in a 
like cool bag, that sort of yeah, thing. With yeah, with the cool bag. Bringing it, fro some of it frozen and leaving it in the cool yeah. bag. Yeah. I just think it's it's a confidence thing, you know, you're having the freshest bait in the swim. Yep. Although I know Ali uses it, you know, he'll leave it sweating in the bag and he thinks that the sugar's coming out of it and make it better. Yeah. So. It's personal preference, it isn't is, it? Yeah. It's what you're confident in. I think what you can say is that you will catch whatever bait you use on main lines, you'll catch fish on it, won't you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. What Damien's doing now is trying to drag the fish almost towards these reeds to get it to kite the other way round. It's a ploy that sometimes works. Because if you side strain them that way, they tend to kite that way. If you side strain them that way, they tend to kite that way. He's a master of tricking them into the net, this boy. Try to. Yeah. Because if you, the, the harder you pull, the harder they pull back, don't yeah, they? Yeah, exactly. They just want them like a dog on a lead and lead them back to you. Exactly. I think he's coming back. Trust you to a good big one when there's no other lines in the swim. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, got him. Good man. Another one falls to the main line. A bait I've got complete confidence in on any lake I go to. This one, just under 40 pounds of absolutely stunning common carp. Look at this, a lovely Lahore common, just over 31 pounds. Caught it off the spot again at 135 yards using the 10 pound subline and new tapered subline leaders. There are two different tapered lines in the range now, making long range fishing really easy. First of all, Damien's using the tapered subline leaders. So you get five leaders on a spool in various breaking strains. Which ones are you using, mate? I'm using 10 pound subline main line yep. to the 0.28 leader. Right, okay. And the leader goes up to what uh, point? 0.50, which is about 35 to 40 pound breaking strain. Right, okay. So by joining two lines together of a similar diameter, You've you, got get, you get a tiny little knot. Tiny little knot, yeah. And uh, I'll use a, a four turn back to back grinner knot. Right. And I'll leave the towels quite long so we haven't got a little stubby bit catching the line as it goes through. So you're, you're tying one grinner first yep. around, one piece, around the other piece of line and then the other gr grinner and then the two are Join coming together. down and joining Join together. And you get a tiny little knot. Right, okay. now, those two diameters being the same is really important. Yeah, and you don't have to put that in the same place on the spool every time, do you? No, I used to. I used to do yeah. that, but with these, I just don't, I haven't even bothered. Just wind it straight on. Yeah, when, when you cast as much as you are here, because with that crosswind, you don't drop it right every single time, do you? It no. does take a few goes. There's nothing worse than having to keep getting it all right and getting it at the bottom of the spool when you get out of a rhythm, yeah, don't you? Yeah, it's a nightmare doing that. But, you know, I found that with these leaders, you don't have to do any of that. Just keep the spool wet, keep the line wet, and it just flies out there. And uh, I'm guessing as well, if you're fishing up against snags and that sort of stuff, if if you snap off, it's going to snap at the leader knot, isn't it? So if you get caught in an island or whatever, yeah. you're not going to le leave like 40, 50 yards of line sailing off the island. No. It'll probably snap at the leader that, that knot. That is such an advantage. Oh, actually, I snapped up earlier, pulled into a snag and it broke right. at, the, uh, at the leader knot. And, it, you know, because it was late in the day, put another leader on and it went straight back out in the same place. Yeah. So what was the reason for not doing the tapered leaders out of adrenaline, which is obviously the casting line in the range. Why were they done out of subline? Well, because the subline's less stretch. Yep. It's more abrasive resistant, right. heavier. Uh, it's just a beautiful material. Yeah, yeah, it's certainly very robust, isn't it? And if you're giving something like loads of punishment, you want a line that's just going to last and last yeah. and last. Yeah, it's been so successful. You know, this year loads of people have started using subline. Yeah, it's such some a very good, good anglers as well, yeah. actually. You know, people that don't normally go in the mags and all that sort of thing. We've had a little bit of feedback from them, haven't we, that, you know, it's the best line they've ever used. Yeah, I think it really, I think it'll be a classic that will stand the test of time. So, Dan, you're using the tapered main line. Why have you preferred to use that? Um, well, it's, it's the best of the best, really. You know, um, all right, you only get two goes at it because you've got a tapered length at either end of a 300 metre spool. So if you crack off once, you reverse it round, you know, wind it onto another spool and the leader's on the top yeah. again. So you only get two goes. And I mean, I haven't cracked off once and I must have cast 200 times, you know, but not having a leader knot there at all, all right, it's a little bit more expensive than doing it the way you're doing it, but it just never, ever catches, you know. No. And uh, to have that thick part at the end, even if you're not range fishing, 
you know, is such an advantage if you're playing fish around snags and all that sort of thing. But here, you just, when you're casting and casting, you just need to know it's not going to snap yeah. and it's not going to frap up. Because if you think that's going to happen, you don't give it as much, do you? No, you, you don't. Know, right. You hang back off of it. And, uh, you know, having that available in, you know, I mean, I'm using the 030 to 055. Um, it goes right down to 028, which is eight pound line yep. to 055 for really blatting it when there's no snags at all. And then there's another 033, which it breaks at about 14 pound, I suppose, the main line up to 055. So like somewhere like Gigantica, where there are a few snags around and sometimes you, you do have to pull really hard, that's the one I'd use there. So there's sort of something in the range for everybody. And you, you get a lot of guys, you know, they're, they're not casting big rods and they've got 50 pound leaders know, on, yeah. great big leader knots and all that. And it's just not balanced, no, is it, you know? Right. So if you go down to, you know, if you're not a big caster and you go down to the 028, um, you'll get miles with that, even a lot of three pound test curve yeah. rods, you know. I suppose the other thing is in the UK, we've got a lot of lakes that won't allow leaders. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a big advantage but because there's no leader knot there at all. You can get around that rule. And I know people I know that, that fish those sort of places have used other lines that have got the same sort of makeup where there's no knot and there's just a tapered leader at either end. Um, and whilst you know they've cast further than they would have done just with 15 pound line, I'll yep. say, um, it, they're still a bit wiry. And because the sub line's so soft, it just flies off the spool. And I know Mark Hutchinson's been badgering me <laughs> some samples <laughs> of it so he can get miles out on the place that he's fishing. So, you know, it's a definite way of getting around um, those rules. One or two casting styles now, mate. What tips can you give to people for getting extra distance? Extra distance, well, it's all about foot position. Right. You know, you and using your body weight. I'm only a little bloke, yep. you know, so I have to use everything I've got. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my casting style is to sort of lean back yep. and start the cast and then pull forward. Hate yep. it out there. You've, yep. got to, you've got to push and pull. Yep. You know, push this one out and pull this one back as hard as you can. Yeah, I've noticed as well that your hand speed is really quick yeah. as well. And there's, there's like a shift in the top part of your body that, that whacks it out there. Because, I mean, we have had to really be hammering it to get it out we there have, yeah. in this wind, haven't they? And, I mean, I've seen you come like this sort of, a, you throw it back and come around the side. Yeah. And also you're doing an overhead thump as well. So yep. what, when do you choose between the two? Um, depends on uh, depends how I feel on some days right. and, and how much space I've got. Right. In these swims, we've got plenty of space. Yep. The overhead thump is you know is a very powerful cast. It locks the rod up really quickly. Um, it's not one that I use all the time, but the, the sort of more fluid cast where I let the lead go out the front and come around the back. Yep. That, that's something I've done for years, and it's kind of hard to change. You know, yeah, you yeah, get used yeah. to doing it. And you know, if your foot position's right, wherever you look, I seem to cast, and that's, that's where, where it, goes. it goes. It's only in massive crosswinds when you've got variables like the line being bowed out and it's dragging the lead round yeah. and you have to change the lead size and that sort of thing so. yeah 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 one thing i've noticed recently i went out with mark hutchinson for a day and that movement of the body starting off on your back foot transferring your weight through onto your front foot um, makes so much difference and having that right arm up in the air really gripping the rod with your left hand and really pulling yeah. into that you know i've even like when i've been going to the gym which is not as often as i should do but um, i've even started doing that sort of exercise now. Um, one of the guys who um, is in the South African carp fishing team, he was saying that all their boys in the team all train to carp, really? you know, yeah, to build their shoulders up and stuff. And uh, I think if you can combine that sort of fluid motion with good, good hand speed and move your body yeah. at the same time, that's what gets a long way. Yeah, you know? and practice. Absolutely. You watch people like Mark, who's cast and cast and cast doesn't seem to put any effort into no, it, no, yet it goes miles, yeah. you know. Um, and I would say if, if anybody wanted to cast further, going out with a tutor who teaches you how to cast will get miles further than you'd ever get on your own, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, he's worth its weight in gold, I would say. He put 30 yards on your cast, didn't he? Yeah, it? yeah, I went from, with a, with a marker float clipped up, I went from 140 to 170 with a marker float, and I was getting just about there with the, the fishing rods as yeah. well, you know, and that was in a couple of hours, so, you know, a day out with somebody like that, oh, that was a bleep on my rod. A day out with somebody like that is um, worth every penny. Definitely. How about that for a super pristine mirror carp? 39 pounds of muscle packed male mirror carp. You can tell it's a male because it's milting at the moment. The fish are going to be spawning in a few weeks time. And uh, this one led me a merry dance taking line at 130 yards. I thought it was an absolute monster, but uh, still well pleased all the same. So. That is our guide to lines for long range fishing. I'm sure out of one of those two, you're going to find something that suits you perfectly.
One of my favourite features of the Delkin Alarm is the great range of sensitivity. Fishing at Lahore, we've had to fish bowstring string tight lines and the bites have been very small movements, so they've shown up straight away and that's due to the great range of sensitivity that the Alarm offers. Look at this beast. Just over 53 pounds of absolutely beautiful common carp. Caught to the 20 pound end trap and size six choddy B. What a beast. Obviously there's no point being all that way out there if the rig is tangled. And to be honest, me and Damien have both experienced tangles during this session. So we've sort of adjusted what we're doing to cut that down to a minimum. So if we have a look at the first hook link here, the first thing, the heaviest hook bait you can put on will create less tangles. Now obviously that goes against casting a long way, but I was starting off with just a small part of a dumbbell and I've increased the size of that quite significantly to put a bit more weight there. The next thing down, looking down the hook link, you see there's a small size sinker on there. We actually found if we got a tangle, it was actually tangled around the putty that we'd been moulding around the sinker. So we stripped the putty away and that stopped happening. And then thirdly, you've got a hinge at the end there. That's one way to stop a tangle. If the hook link can fold back flat against the tubing, there's a lot less chance of it tangling. So that's the first one. That's the hybrid stiff material. Obviously being very stiff, it stops it tangling as well. So that's your sort of classic combi rig. And then the next one is the one I've been catching most of my fish over the last couple of days on, and that is the IQ2 D rig. So it's 15 pound IQ2, which has got some inherent stiffness to it as well. I'm using a larger bait there, which is obviously gonna help keep it away from the tubing and stop it tangling. I'm actually tying that up with PVA before I cast it, so there's no way the hook can go into the bait on the cast. I've got a larger sinker on there, the largest one we do, no putty around it whatsoever. And then moving down the hook link, you can see I've got one of our anti-tangle sleeves that I've just cut down a little bit and I've pulled it onto the knot of the hook link and just super glued it in place. So I've still got that hinge effect there, but we've got some stiffness right at the end to help push everything away and stop it tangling around the lead. And then the last one is incorporating the anti-tangle sleeve as it was meant to be. So looking at that end, we've got no pivot point there at all. So what, what's basically going to happen on the cast, that's going to force the hook link away from the tubing because it won't fold back. So you've got one that folds back completely and one that holds it off a long way. Both work, but this one in particular has worked really well for us. And this is the one that Rob uses when he's fishing here, the bailiff on here who fishes here all the time, that's how he fishes it to keep the two apart. And then moving down that 15 pound IQ2 hook link, we've got a small size sinker, no putty around it at all. And you can see there as well, I've got a stiff hair the hair is a continuation of the 15 pound IQ2. No need to PVA that up. Because it's a stiff hair, it's never gonna tangle. And on the bottom, because I've got a little bit of buoyancy to that bait, it's the hook stay, still gonna lay flat, but the bait's just gonna sit just up like that. So you've got some buoyancy in it, so it goes in the mouth easily, and that's gonna turn and catch hold really quickly. And the other thing we've noticed, how you cast and how hard you hit the clip makes a massive difference to whether the rig tangles or not. We've had very, very windy conditions here. And basically, if you cast too hard and hit the clip too hard, what you can do is spin the rig just before it hits the surface. There's no depth of water for it to straighten out again, and that's what creates a tangle. So what we're trying to do is cast just hard enough so we just hit the clip, it lays everything out away from the tubing and drops down and it's not tangled. If you find you're not hitting the clip at all, or you're hitting it too hard, chances are the rig is tangled, so it's worth winding it in and re-chucking it. So that's what we've learned in the last couple of days. Put it into your own fishing and it will stop tangles as well. Well, I'm attached to what feels like a very big Lahore carp. I was taking line at 130 yards, so while it's a long way out, um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, bait and bait application um, because all us guys sort of take it for granted that we use good bait um, and we don't really swap from one bait to another until really the companies that sponsor us ask us to and uh, I've been using mainline now for god knows nearly 20 years I suppose and uh, every single bait that they have 
provided for me has done the business. Obviously I've got my favourites and I'd say out of all of them, I would say Activate and probably the Cell are my two favourites. Um, but I've caught loads of fish on Fusion and that's what Damien and I won the British Championships on years ago. Um, NRG has been really good for me. Pulse as well. But the most important thing is they're all got great ingredients in and they're all fresh. So oh, this fish is properly staying out of range here, I tell you, it feels a good one. It's so important to use good quality bait nowadays because the fish have got a choice at the end of the day. There's loads of people fishing around every lake and uh, them fish can pick and choose what they want to eat and they're going to choose the nicest tasting thing. And if, uh, if they feel good for it, then they're going to eat it again. And that's the whole thing of using good quality boilie. And uh, if you just stick to something from the mainline range, whatever one it is, uh, whether it be sell or new grange or activate, whatever, and you keep using that bait, I promise you, you'll get brilliant results on it. It's the people that chop and change every week because they haven't caught anything they're the ones who struggle because if you've got a good bait on and you haven't caught anything, you've either put it in the wrong place or your rig's not working properly. And that's the whole point of fishing is to learn how to keep putting it in the right place more and more often. And if you're constructing a good rig with a sharp hook, which is the most important thing, then you'll get results. So rather than chopping and changing, chopping and changing, keep to the same boilie, keep using them fresh all the time. And when you put it in front of a feeding fish, you will catch them. Got him? Yes, come on! Wicked. What a battle that was. That is one big common is carp, it? man. <laughs> wicked, man, wicked. The shoulders on it. Oh my God, look at that. <laughs> let's, let's I think, I think it's done your 52. Yeah. Beastie. Get in. Result. Even this end feels heavy. Bloody hell. 60. Yeah? Yeah, man. 63. For 63.12. 63.12. Come on! Look at that. 63 pound, 12 ounces. Smash my PB again. What a place. I'd just like to say thanks to Rob and everybody at Lahore for looking after us and letting us come and fish for these absolute whackers. We've had a fantastic time here. And I hope it's added something to your long range fishing. It's certainly honed my skills. And uh, we're going to do some pictures now. And then we're off to other lakes to show you more tactics and tips. Oh, I'm made up. Well, we've got some. April showers, and look at that to go with it. 63 pound bar of gold. Mwah. Thank you, my love. See you when you're bigger. Like a baby whale. Oh, okay.
You're going to die! You're going to die! 